Hello, if I can get your attention, please. Thank you for coming uh, to the Lunch and Learn today. I'm Chick Hardy with the Benedictine Institute, and I'm happy to say that once again we've collaborated with the McCarthy Center and, and our speaker for today. Um, I tell you, I was reading his, his CV, and it reads almost like Forrest Gump. You know, I mean, he, he's done everything, so <laughs> I'm sorry. But <laughs> um, um, he is our uh, St. John alumnus, John Cromie, and he's currently vice president of the Cooperative Housing Foundation, and he's been with them since 1996, and he may tell us a little bit about that, but honestly, I was going through it, and it's like, where do I what do I include? And I'm sure he's heard this several times over the last couple of days. Um, but he has significant overseas experience, you know, like 55 different countries, so I won't list them. <laughs> but uh, he's met with three American presidents, one pope, it almost sounds like a joke, doesn't it? And the heads of state <laughs> from six countries. Um, he's, uh, let's see, on three occasions he's testified before c congressional committees of the U.S. Congress. He has met with leadership of Native American communities. He's ridden camels, elephants, and donkeys, a man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> Must talk to you about that. Um, he hitchhiked for six weeks throughout the Middle East where he visited numerous fascinating cities, but he also bargained for swords, carpets, and jewels. And he claims to have spent six hours in Yemen once bargaining in the shop of Alibaba and Sons. <laughs> now I want to know what took six hours, and what did you buy? <laughs> and did you get it home? <laughs> um, he served as honorary pallbearer at Sergeant Shriver's funeral, where he met Stevie Wonder, Bono, Oprah Winfrey, and Vanessa Williams. Like I say, Forrest Gump all over again. Um, and all this in the name of negotiating private and public partnerships in development programs. And now he's here with us. He can add us to his, his extensive list. One thing that he didn't mention which came up, you know, during the registration process, you can indicate if you have any dietary needs. Someone, and I won't say who, unless I'm forced to, or paid, uh, said that we should have rum malt for, for lunch, and that there's a John Cromie story associated with that. I'm a little curious about that, but I don't know if, we, if he'll share that or not. Um, but would you please join me in welcoming John Cromie as he comes to speak on sharing Benedictine values around the world. One of the things I learned is that life is indeed like a box of chocolate. You never quite know what you're going to get when you bite into one. And uh, I'm going to try to mount this, then I can walk around a little bit and not be so tied to this podium. Uh, and so can everybody hear me now, or is it, uh, is it coming through clearly? Okay. Good. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, the Forrest Gump analogy I had not made before. Uh, but uh, since you brought up the rum, uh, rum shakes, I'm going to out her right this very moment. Those of you who've been around a while, you know one of the um, sources of information on, on public health and health care and, and taking care of yourself and so on is a longtime employee here, a uh, friend and uh, uh, heroine to a lot of sick Johnnies and monks and so on, Eileen Haig. <laughs> and the story, maybe you can hit and uh, this 
Technology will screw you up every time, I just want you to know. The story is that uh, I, I came to St. John's in 1960 as a freshman and uh, stayed here for two and a half years and then I was invited by the John F. Kennedy administration and the Peace Corps to go to the Peace Corps in India. I left, went to India for a couple of years, had a fantastic experience which started me on this whole new life. And I came back home, and then a fine young lady, who is the mother of my daughter here, Caroline uh, Gor Cromie Gord, who's here with me today, uh, had waited for me for those two years. And I got back just in time, because I think if she'd had to wait 25 months, she'd have been gone. There were others <laughs> circling in the, in the wings. Uh, and, but I managed to get back just in time, and she and I, uh, got married in that fall of 65, and we moved into a trailer owned by Eileen and Dick Haig just across Highway 52 or whatever it is, uh, and uh, that was our housing my senior year. Uh, being good Catholics, very soon after we got married, she was pregnant, and she was working in St. Cloud at the uh, business school Minnesota School of Business, owned by a former Johnny at that time, a couple of them, Sexton and Amundsen. And um, she and Eileen would get together late in the afternoon. Eileen was pregnant with her uh, upcoming son. And so the two of them together, apparently to settle their stomachs, decided that they would mix up in the blender uh, milkshakes and sort of top it off with a little rum. <laughs> So when Dick and I would come home, we'd find these two pregnant women just smiling nicely and in good mood and enjoying themselves having drunk these rum things, they called them. And of course, uh, the two children were born victims of fetal alcohol syndrome. And I, yeah. I always thought it was unfair to blame it on the fetal. It was definitely the mother alcohol. And they were so distorted by this that my daughter uh, ended up being a Phi Beta Kappa from Grinnell College and worked with the NASA Space Program and is now in Texas a consultant uh, on writing proposals for the government funding. And her son, who's a fellow victim, ends up being a medical doctor in Sauk Center, right? So clearly they suffered severely from uh, the uh, Forrest Gump fetal alcohol syndrome. I came to St. John's from New Prague, Minnesota. I was a Minnesota farm boy my whole life. I was the first member of our family to go to college. It was an incredible opportunity. And coming to St. John's was uh, like going to a whole new world for me. Meeting people with PhDs, meeting people who'd studied at Harvard and at Cornell and people who were actively involved in the administration of the upcoming Vatican II Council, people with, with you know, reputations for being great scholars in their field. This was all new to me, completely new. What was also new was finding out I was competing in the classroom with guys from De La Salle and St. Thomas Academy and, uh, and Benil, all those places where, when we were in high school, we read one Shakespeare thing. These guys from Benilde and De La Salle had read all the Shakespeare stuff, you know. So it was a tough new environment, but it was a great experience. And, um, and uh, I found out when I came in August 1960 that in order to make the football team, you had to go to church every morning with John Gagliardi. <laughs> I discovered later that he only stayed for the first few minutes to see if we were there, and then he... <laughs> but... Uh, they, they, they intimidated us, and, you know, so all through my years here, I went to church every day, so apparently he's not so successful with the current football team. They haven't been going to church enough. Um, there were uh, a number of people here at St. John's who, who um, significantly affected my, uh, both my faith and learning. I, of course, grew up Catholic and was trained by the Franciscan nuns at St. Wenceslaus School, a parish in New Prague, Minnesota, that, interestingly enough, was founded by monks from St. John's who came, went from here to 
Shakopee, Minnesota, based themselves in Shakopee and went around the rural areas near there and helped set up parishes. So my Benedictine hist uh, tradition, which I didn't even know about until much later, had started at a very early age. I was taught there, and it was continued here at St. John's, uh, basic Catholic values. And I've tried to carry those out all through my life in my sort of simple interpretive way. The values I was taught and I remember and have tried to carry out is to treat people fairly, be honest or be quiet, love and care for your family, care about Though others, especially those who are poor or are handicapped or who are disadvantaged, and actively pursue a just and benevolent society. And of course, attend church and donate to good causes. That's sort of my practical religious philosophy that I've tried to live all my life as a result of my Catholic education at St. Wenceslaus and here at St. John's. I have to talk about St. John's. If any of you are here from the College of St. Benedict's, I'm sorry. I um, had very little experience with St. Benedict's, uh, except for occasional Friday and Saturday night visits to fine young ladies there, uh, which were interrupted by the very early curfew that we all had at that time. And it's very difficult to whisper sweet nothings to a charming lady when the, when the nuns are standing on the other side of the glass door, you know, pointing at their, at their watch, you know. You had to pretend that you were reciting lyrical poetry or something when uh, you preferred to be saying and doing other things. So my experience at St. Benedict's was very limited and somewhat traumatic, actually, in that case. <laughs> At St. John's, I also learned the importance of a balance between work and worship, the spiritual side and the physical side of uh, human life. Uh, it always amazed me to see the monks going and praying three, four, five times a day. I served uh, mass in the lower church for uh, priests almost every morning. And, uh, and I just, it, it's, it really, the worship side and the spiritual side came on stronger as I was influenced more and more by the Benedictines here. I learned from the Benedictines to respect differences, to tolerate a variety of ideas and disagreements. A few of you are old enough to remember the famous economic battles we had between Father Gervais and Father Martin one being a Keynesian and another one being a Milton Friedman conservative. And so as we crossed the hall, those of us who went to economic classes, we had to forget everything we learned on the left side and so over to the right and then vice versa and so on. I had an opportunity you know, about 10 years later to ask a great economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, about this problem, why it is that economists seem to always disagree with each other and have and uh, Mr. Galbraith said, well, Mr. Cromie, it's probably better that we, do, we economists do disagree, because if we all agreed, we'd probably all be wrong. <laughs> so that was another lesson I learned. But the respect for differences uh, the, uh, it was really something I learned here. And then I began to seep into me. I was a history major, and it just began to seep in here the value of history, of traditions, of you know, taking time for reading and contemplation. I would see the monks walking on the sidewalks reading their bravery or reading books. Joe Heinegger, Steve Humphrey, and others just drilled into us that reading can bring open to you a whole new world. And time to think and read and contemplate uh, came out of my experience here with the Benedictines. A respect for nature and our environment and for the care of all that we have and a recycling of what we have. Uh, something that I learned here by osmosis with the brothers and the monks 
And now the rest of the world is catching up with St. John's and with the Benedictines and saying, you know, that's really a good idea. And I thanked Father Hillary yesterday for two things. One was for serving on the committee that designed the Abbey Church, which in my mind is truly a great, great architectural structure and a great contribution to the Catholic Church around the world. And I also thanked him for making sure we didn't follow Marcel Brewer's plan to destroy this building and build a whole new complex here. It is just a stunningly gorgeous and inspiring building in this day. And I'm jealous of all of you who get to work here every day. And now I haven't been here when they have to shift the air conditioning to heat and back and forth. So <laughs> I suspect that might not be. I did see some stacks of firewood at the guest house, so I figured maybe I was on my own for some of that. Anyway, at St. John's, I'll, I have to send out today, and I, you know, I do this with some trepidation because I realize now that I look at the crowd here, most of you weren't even born when I was here. But there were some people here that just made a world of difference to me, and you may know them, and, uh, or at least know of them. Father Don Talifas, who is still a, here and is, of course, an institution un, unto himself. He's one of the few people I know who's actually a legend in his own time. Uh, Father Hilary Timish for the great work he did on uh, helping design this church, you know, and going through all the trouble. To me, it looks like a finished, perfect product, but apparently there were lots of battles that went on in between to design that thing. Prof Heinegger, who I think is dead now, but who drilled that history into our head, and by God, he made sure we were going to learn whether we wanted to or not. His style was that when you, the bell rang, he walked over the door of the classroom, turned the key, locked the door, and started speaking as he turned the key, and lectured us with new material until the bell rang, and he went over and turned the key, and we, you know, and in... He had assigned us four chapters to read. He didn't repeat any of that. He said, if you haven't learned that uh, on your own, you're not gonna get it from me. He was giving us additional information and insight into the complexities of that particular age or time and so on. Uh, Steve Humphrey, of course, is just a wonderful, wonderful man who introduced me to poetry and reading and the uh, literature. Ed Henry, Professor Ed Henry, great political science uh, and my guidance counselor and the one who encouraged me to go into the Peace Corps. Father Walter Redger was, of course, another legend. I got to work in the alumni office with him and Isabel Durenberger, another legendary lady. And he and his cigar were famous, and in those days you could still smoke a cigar in this building. Uh, great man. Uh, Daniel Durkin was our dean of uh, young men and uh, guided us in ways that we probably needed to be guided. And finally, Coleman Berry. My fa final theology class at St. John's when I came back was after Vatican II, and uh, Coleman Berry called me in and said, you know, there's a lot of new things in the church now, and I have this two-volume history of the Catholic Church, and it needs to be updated in light of, of uh, Vatican II. So for three credits in uh, fourth year theology, I will give that to you if you will read these two history books and highlight for me everything that needs to be rethought or redirected as a result of Vatican II. At the moment, I thought, well, that's going to be an easy, easy three credits. <laughs> then I found out, first of all, I had to study everything that Vatican II put out, which was a whole two semesters worth the work all itself. And then I had to read the darn books, and then I had to compare them, and then I had to go face Coleman, and he'd say, what are you talking about? That doesn't mean, you know, and so on. So those were some of the toughest exams I ever had. Uh, but Father Coleman Berry was a great inspiration. I already told you about the Gervais, Gervais Martin battles. They were fantastic. Father David McDarby, who just passed away, Patrick McDarby, taught me something that served me better than anything else in my professional life. He taught me how to write a coherent, logical, short sentence, paragraph, and without one misspelling. He used to assign us these English literature things. And uh, we'd write these great things about all oh, how we understood Shakespeare and all of this. And we'd get them back and I'd have a D on it because I had three misspellings. 
And I'd go and moan and whine to him and say, but the, 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 the substance was fantastic. He said, Mr. Cromie, when you go out in the real world, if you misspell things, your substance isn't going to count for anything because no one will respect you when you have three spelling errors in your damn letter or your, your proposal. He was absolutely right. And to this day, when I read a resume that comes across my desk, if there's a misspelling in the resume, I throw it out. I said, you know, if the guy doesn't care enough to get his spelling right now with spell check, he's not professional enough to work for me. And then the final one was Father Roland Barron. Father Roland, for those of you who don't know, was this giant of a man, or he seemed like a giant of a man. He probably wasn't that big. Crew cut, white hair. I think originally born in Germany, lived in France a long time, came here, and he taught us French. Actually, he taught us terror. <laughs> if we learned a little French on the side, it was because we were... <laughs> he would come in, close the door, and say, Gentlemen, would somebody in French give me an example of a pluperfect pronoun? Something like that. And we'd all sit there. And one or two of the guys from Benil would try, you know. <laughs> and then he'd say, ah, folks, if you can't do it in French, can you at least give me an example in English? And of course, by that time, we were even more nervous, so then we couldn't even do one in English. Then he'd say, ah, folks, how can the English department recompense me for teaching not only French, but the English too? How can I give you the frosting when you don't even have the cake? Uh, he terrorized us. We learned some French. I went to Paris one time and tried to use that French, and I won't give you the results. But the gist of it was the policeman said to me, where do you want to go? I've never forgotten Father Roland, bless his soul. Um, and I left St. John's, joined the Peace Corps, went to India, and what a magnificent opportunity that was. So, total other side of the world in every which way, geography, history, tradition, climate, religions, people, way of life, economics, it was just, just a monumental change. Having grown up and been taught by the Franciscans about you know, the Catholics uh, could go to heaven. Our separate, separated brethren, other Christians may or may not get to heaven. They're going to have to put a lot of time in purgatory. <laughs> Maybe they'll get into God's, God's final heaven. But certainly, the other folks, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the other pagans, were not destined for God's final eternal reward. This was before Vatican II. In June of 1960, I was walking in a village and it dawned on me that all around me were all these pagans and heathens that my fourth grade teacher had taught me about. Hindu families, Muslim families. And over the years, I found that they were good people. They wanted to raise their children well. They wanted opportunities for the future. They cared about each other. And their religion told them the same things mine did. A different God or gods, but the same fundamental, be good to each other, the golden rule, care for the poor, and so on. And that started me learning that, in fact, all around the world, 90% of the people are good people with the same goals and objectives as the rest of us. I remember confronting Father Don Telefes when I came here about the, you know, the Apostles' Creed we, we read at Mass. Uh, made that a little hard to absorb, you know? Um, but that was a great insight. And it started me thinking much more than I ever had before. I, and that was followed by, as she said, I hitchhiked through Europe, on the, uh, through the Middle East on the way home. I learned... Uh, that, in fact, uh, that part of the world, dangerous as it is, interesting it is, again, is filled with lots and lots of people who just want to live their lives. And I also hitchhiked on that same trip through Czechoslovakia, which was under communist rule. 
And being from Nova Praha, I went to Old Praha and visited um, the town of my great grandfathers and so on, and uh, saw how people lived under a communist rule. And that opened another whole set of. I came back here, finished my degree, got my degree in June 1966, went back overseas to India, and have had a wonderful career since then, working for the Peace Corps and then with the War on Poverty in Chicago and Atlanta and then ultimately back with the Peace Corps in the Caribbean, and then to Washington, and then uh, eight years working with, again, one of the great honors and blessings of my life, working with Eunice Kennedy Shriver, the sister of President Kennedy, as the National Director of Special Olympics. Gave me an opportunity to care about the handicapped and the physically challenged, the mentally challenged. It gave me an opportunity to work with one of the really great humanitarians, Eunice, Kennedy Shriver and her husband, Sarge Shriver. They have changed the world the way we treat people with mental handicaps. It's just the phenomenal people. I worked with the Kennedy family. That was an experience beyond all belief because John Kennedy, of course, was my hero in 1960 when I came here and joined the Peace Corps. And I worked with them and visited their home in uh, Hyannis Sports and visited their homes in Washington, got to know most of them, including Senator Kennedy, all of it a great privilege. And from that experience, I learned two things that I would share with you. One is that these people had no end of ideas and ambitions to change the world for the better. They are Catholics. They believe it is our responsibility to care about those less privileged than ourselves. And they will spare no moment, no idea, no plan, no resource to make this happen. Uh, they just are totally committed to that. The result is when you work for them, you are exhausted because there is no end to what goes on. But you're also exhilarated and you're inspired uh, by their total commitment and the change they achieve and the people that they get to help with this. The other thing I learned, and I worked with Mrs. Shriver, we traveled together, we drove in the car together, spent long hours together, that their code is, you never complain. This is a woman whose oldest brother was killed in World War II. Her oldest sister died in a plane crash in the 1940s. Her brother, who she absolutely worshipped, was president of the United States for two years, 10 months, and was assassinated. Her other brother, who was her kid brother, who she smacked around when they were, you know, youngsters together, and was running for president and was assassinated in 1968. Her father had a stroke and was bedridden or wheelchair ridden, the great, who, her father, who she just adored. I never once heard that woman complain about the cards dealt to her. She talked about all these people like they were still alive. She talked about, she said, I remember Jack used to say this and I, Bobby used to do this and so on. She never once in the eight years I worked closely with her and the 25 years after that that I was a friend with her ever, ever complained about what had happened to them what tragedies had happened to them. It just, it seemed to me, and, the, and that's true of the whole family. I, you know, the kids, the grandkids, and so on, nobody ever complains. They talk about Uncle Jack, and they talk about Uncle Bobby, but they never, ever complain. And that taught me something, that. Because if ever there was a family that had a right to feel that life was unfair to them, they were the ones. I'll end with a couple of things. And uh, Matt's in charge of making sure I don't go on and on because I have a tendency, there's so many stories. Um, in January of last year, Sergeant Shriver died. And I was blessed with the opportunity to be an honorary pallbearer at this funeral. And to attend that funeral at uh, uh, 
a, a church in Potomac, Maryland. And uh, it was an incredible experience. The Cardinal, Cardinal Worrell, was the officiating uh, priest. Uh, there were, of course, dozens of other priests and altar boys and so on. It was a Catholic grand opera of a funeral mass. There were lots of eulogies. The official eulogers were Bill Clinton and, and Vice President Biden. In the audience, in non-speaking roles, were Michelle Obama, 15 senators, uh, Oprah Winfrey, and so on. Singing the Ave Maria was Vanessa, the great opera star Vanessa Williams. Singing the Make Me a Channel of Your Peace uh, song was Bono. And while he was singing it, Stevie Wonder stood up from his pew and walked down and played his harmonica in partnership with Bono and they sang together. And in the eulogies, two important things came out that reflect on our Catholic background. You know Sarge Schreiber was the ultimate Catholic Christian gentleman. He went to Mass every day of his life, every place he went. Coleman McCarthy told the story of he and Sarge were traveling in New Orleans and they, they passed a Catholic church and Sarge said, you know, it's Friday, I should go to confession. Let's see if confessions are going on. And Coleman McCarthy's a good Catholic also, an active Catholic. And so they went in and sure enough, there were confessions. And so Sarge went into the confession booth and he was in there for five minutes, he was in there for 10 minutes, he was in 15, 20 minutes. Coleman said, you know, what's happened is he had a heart attack or something. And finally, after about 25 minutes, he comes out and, and Coleman McCarthy says, sorry, are you okay? And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, what took you so long? You just went to confession last Friday. You couldn't have done that much damage. In <laughs> and Sarge says, well, no, that wasn't the problem. The problem I found out was that the priest is a very conservative uh, Republican. So I, it took me 20 minutes to, to uh, get him to think a little bit more reasonably. And uh, so Colin McCarthy said, so what did he give you for, for your uh, penance? And he said, that's the bad part. <laughs> he told me I had to be nice to Republicans for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, Sarge was just an in incredible person and his daughter said he was a great Christian gentleman and he gave me two things. One is he taught me that as a woman and his daughter, there were no limits on what I could do. And whatever I wanted to do as a professional woman, mother, career, my dad was behind me. He was the greatest father in the world. The other gift he gave me was that he taught my brothers how to be a loving, supporting, partnering husband with a powerful, capable, professional woman. Each of my brothers learned that lesson by watching dad. Really, truly partnering with Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who was a dynamite person. She said those were great gifts. And the last thing that came, Mark Shriver's son told the story and I have to share it with you because it changed my thinking. I'm getting close to 70 years old now and I begin from time to time to think about, you know, I'm on the downhill run and there's what really is there in the next life. And Mark told about the day that he and his dad were in western Florida and they, at the end of the day they came back to the motel and his dad went out on the veranda and there was this fantastic sunset. The sky was glowing gold and red and colors. And his dad was just standing there staring at it. And this is a man of 65 years old or so at the time. And so Mark said, Dad, what are you thinking? And his dad said, Mark, I'm thinking, I can't wait till I die. And Mark said, oh my God, you know, Dad, that's, you know, you're young, healthy. He said, I can't wait to meet the creator who can make this happen. He said, 
It's going to be a great, great adventure to die and finally meet the creator who made all of this happen. What a fantastic being that must be. And I can't wait till I meet him. I sat there stunned. I said, you know, my friend was right. This is just a way station on the way. And as great and as blessed as it's been, meeting all these people, traveling, having a wonderful family, being married to a magnificent woman, having wonderful children, now great grandchildren. They, they tried to enroll my grandson yesterday in the political science department. Uh, he's 12 years old. And, uh, but it's, it's all part of an adventure heading for the next one, which is going to be really something fantastic. And that I learned by, from the son of my dear friend, Sergeant Shriver, one of the great American Catholics who changed half of the world. And um, I was proud of and honored to be a friend of his and to have that be part of the life I was able to live as a result of leaving the farm in New Prague, being the first one to go to college, coming to St. John's, and being exposed to the Benedictine monks here, and then going off around the world and living a life of service. Actually, Sarge and I one time were sitting in his office and we were our feet, we put our feet up, we had a couple of glasses of cognac that somehow magically appeared. It was about eight o'clock in the evening and we were talking and Sarge says to me, he says, you know, John, we're two of the lucky, luckiest son of a bitches in the world. <laughs> and I said, why is that? He said, because we got, our careers have oper given us the opportunity to do what Christ wanted us to do, to live the Sermon on the Mount, to live the great Christian life, and they paid us to do it. <laughs> I said, so, well, now that's, you know, when you and I die, we're going to have to go face St. Peter, and uh, we'll be in a position to say, you know, when he says, you know, what did you do to earn your way in here, we'll be able to say, well, you know, we helped the poor, we helped the mentally challenged, we, you know, we started these poverty programs, Head Start, legal services, Peace Corps, we've done all these things, you know, and uh, we have to then pray that he doesn't ask you, how much did they pay you to do all that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it really has been a magnificently blessed and fortunate life. I don't know if it's quite Forrest Gump. I think he ended up very rich from that shrimp business. Uh, and I certainly never ran from one coast to the other. But it's been fabulous. And I thank St. John's. I thank all of you. I thank Father Elbrick, who was here in, in my day, and Don Telephus, and all of those folks. And I thank you for listening to me. And, uh, and I thank you for the welcome we've gotten since we've been here these last three or four days. And um, You'll always remain in my heart, too. And, and if I don't see you again, I'll probably come back to the campus in the next few years. But if I don't see you again here, then I'm going to see you in that great adventure in the, in the next one someplace or another. We'll all look at those sunsets together, OK? Thank you so much. Did you want to give up some of your books? Are they here? Yeah. Okay, bring, uh, bring two of them over. I, I have an autobiography of Sergeant Shriver's life that I brought some copies and I would be happy to share them with anyone here who would like to read about this. And I've already given them to the president of the university and to the library. And um, you certainly should feel free, anyone who would like to. I'd be glad for you to have them, and you can share them and share them with others and so on. It's an amazing, amazing story. I do have to give one away uh, myself, and that is, as I told you earlier, I owe a great debt to uh, Dick and Eileen Haig, particularly Eileen Haig for her new milkshake formula. And uh, so I want to give one to her specifically uh, at this moment. And then I'll give you one for Father Hillary as well. 
and uh, and there are a few more for anyone else who would. Don't be shy. You're welcome to them. Okay. Thank you again. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer your questions. Yeah, I, and I've got the mic, so I can do it while I'm going over here to catch Eileen. So, who has a question for him? Oh, for your help, uh, Formula. <laughs> don't be shy. One, I, John, did I did I ever apologize for calling you Forrest Gump? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Do doesn't I have matter. to? Do I have it's to? a nice analogy. <laughs> I have had sort of been able to be in all these places. So. <laughs> he also danced with a, a real life princess. What's going to happen to Caroline Kennedy? Well, Caroline has chosen to live her separate life uh, and to stay very close to her children. And she has her profession. She does, she's chair of the Kennedy Library uh, and the Kennedy Family Foundation. Uh, she still does some things from time to time for the Peace Corps. Uh, but she's not going to be in public life uh, anymore, um, except on occasions of her own choosing. Her, um, the next generation, the grandchildren, you know, some of them are in politics and others are in various uh, careers. And, um, and the family is very, very committed to public service, social service, all the... Uh, Grandchildren had it drilled into their head whether they wanted it or not, and some of them went astray from time to time. Uh, but uh, it's not a family without its problems. You know, one of the boys died from drug overdose, and another one was charged with rape, and so on, those things in the next generation. But uh, by and large, they're, the ones that I know have turned out to be very uh, committed, dedicated to, to public service. Bobby Kennedy Shriver is the one who got Bono involved with Africa and created the Red Dot campaign that's helping villages in Africa, you know, in a great way. And Anthony Shriver has created Best Buddies programs or mentally challenged students are matched with college students. It's a great program. And Maria has her women's uh, opportunities program. She brings together 20, 30,000 women every two years to to build a future for women. Uh, so they're all, uh, and Timmy runs the uh, Special Olympics now in the, after his parents died. And uh, Mark is a vice president for Save the Children. So those Shriver children, that grand, they're all terrific people doing great things. And they're gonna sell the compound in Hyannisport, I just saw, so that'll be a piece of American history that will will uh, will go into into the archives. Yes. Given the amazing life and experiences that you've had, is there anything still on your bucket list that you haven't done that you really want to do? <laughs> um, yes. Although I keep. You know, I, I'm at that Robert Forrest, Frost point. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. <laughs> I have miles to go before I sleep, but it's also tempting to sleep. <laughs> I have a lot of friends in the Middle East, human beings I know personally. Yemen, Lebanon, West Bank, Gaza, Israel, even a few in Iraq and a few in Afghanistan. I am very, very worried about the conflict that seems to be growing between the Islamic world and the Western Christian world. And why am I worried? This is not a new thing. It's been going on for a thousand years. I'm worried because nuclear weapons, even small ones, dirty bombs, we can change the equation. We saw what happened 11 years ago in New York when these people very cleverly thought to take our own airplanes and make them into missiles and attack us. What they could do if they got from Iran or North Korea small nuclear weapons and take them to attack. 
the Western world in their anger towards the West economically and the religious um, dispute. Uh, is for your children and my grandchildren and so on, there's going to be very, very, very serious things that could happen as a result of this conflict of the fundamental theology of Islam and the misunderstanding or non-understanding of secular and Christian West. And their not understanding of us. As I said earlier, 90% of the people in those parts of the world are not concerned about that issue. They just want to raise their children, live a decent life, have a future for their children, and so on. But there is a group of young people that are determined, and it could be very, very dangerous for us. So why am I saying that here? I spoke with Hillary Timish yesterday. We had a very nice conversation. And one of the things when you start to get older and you get a chance to think and look back, I realized a couple of things. One was that St. Benedict started this whole operation that we're in today in the sixth century. Muhammad started his operation in the seventh century. And for 14, 1500 years, they've grown together side by side, separately in different ways. In the 800s, Bernard of Clairvaux, one of the great Benedictines, had the wisdom to send his scholars to Toledo, Spain, to study with Arabic scholars and Hebrew scholars the Greek classics. They translated the Greeks' classics and all that knowledge, mathematics, science, and everything, into Arabic, Hebrew, and Latin. And they opened the door to the Greek information and knowledge to come into Europe. Together they studied and worked together to try to create a better world. And then we shifted to the mentality of the Crusades and the struggle and the wars and the decline of the Islamic world, the growth of the Western world, for which the Islamic world has never recovered. But it was a Benedictine who drove the Pope crazy, Bernard of Clairvaux, by reaching out and doing this together, saying, let's forget our theological differences. Let's concentrate on building something together. So I have said to Hillary and a few others, maybe since since the good Pope Benedict is choosing not to try to bridge this gap, maybe the Benedictines should once more go beyond themselves, lead the way, invite the Ayatollah Khomeini from Karbala, Iraq, to come to St. John's and sit and reason and think together with Father Elbrick and Father Don and the abbot, and let's talk about How do we build a new generation of young people that learn not to hate each other? May the Benedictines could lead the way since it doesn't seem to come from Rome or from even the Jesuits who are always running around doing things but have, who haven't, you know. So I guess that's sort of one, my one dream. And uh, somebody has to, has to. Otherwise, they're teaching their children to hate us. And by default, we're, our children are learning to hate them. And maybe we're also teaching them, I don't know. But that's a very, very dangerous thing. Um, so I, uh, if there was anything I wanted, I would be willing to expend whatever energy I have left on, it would be something like that, because I think it's terribly, terribly, terribly important. And I believe that Jesus Christ, if he was here today, would say, we have to reach up. After all, these are still God's children. You know, however they see it, however they, they, they adore and so on, they're God's children. You know, the Franciscan nuns, bless their souls, were wrong. These people are not condemned, I don't believe, to eternal hell. 
I think there's going to be some way that we all can join in our next adventure together. Um, you know, you may be thinking I had too many brownies or something in the talk. <laughs> but that's sort of in my soul what's left. Uh, and then, but, and then all of that is set aside because what I really want to do is enjoy my grandchildren and have fun with them. And, and, uh, and they really want to teach me how to use this little iPhone that I have, and I'm trying to avoid that as much as I can. Any others? Uh-oh. This is tough. I was just wondering, what, who would you say that your favorite place that you've been is? What's my favorite place that I've been? Well, there's been a number of them. One of the things when you travel around the world, you just, you're, you're, you're inspired in the awe. You just have awe for, um, the natural wonders of the world are, are amazing. But places, Jerusalem, Jerusalem just stuns you. I mean, when you walk into old Jerusalem, it just knocks you off your feet. And I've been back there six, seven, eight times. And Jerusalem is just unusually special. The Taj Mahal in India, same thing. It takes your breath away. It's incredibly stunning, beautiful. And uh, it's lasted 500 years. And it's just amazing. Um, Florence, Italy. Just in front of that Duomo, it's just, uh, these people were geniuses, absolute geniuses. The guy who built the dome had never built the dome before. He never built anything, actually. He was a bronze sculptor, Brunelleschi. He, he made the doors for the baptismal fount. And he figured out how to build the dome 17 stories above the ground another 35 stories up. How he got the bricklayers to go up 17 stories on a ladder every day was just beyond me. And there it sits for 500 years, and it's just stunning. Um, it inspires you also. The Egyptians build pyramids that are unbelievable. And not only do they build unbelievable buildings with 40,000 ton stones, you know, that none of us could move. We couldn't move with the biggest cranes we have now. They built them in exact dimension and location, so they reflect on Earth the three stars in Orion's belt in the constellation Orion. Somebody had the genius to look at that, calculate that, calculate it on Earth, spread it out, and build it here in the exact position and shape. These people had knowledge that we haven't yet with all of our computers found. There are things out there that we, I look up at the sky and I see a thousand swallows flying through the air in formation, swirling like radio waves, moving all at the same time. We have no idea how they do that. We can spend a million dollars on the training of pilots and we can get five of them to fly, you know, the Navy, Navy uh, Thunder Jets or whatever they are within two feet of each other and do tricks. But it takes a million dollars worth of training to get them to do that. And these damn birds just do it. <laughs> they just do it. And we have no idea how they do it. I have no idea. It's an amazing world. Amazing world. Encourage your children and grandchildren to explore that whole world. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you all so very, very much for listening. To me. Thank you, John. And of course, today is the Feast of St. Benedict, so. And I think John did a very nice job of uh, living and capturing the values that he got here and, and uh, has spread them throughout the world. So thank you, John.